1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So this is our, our uh, I, I think, our last sermon from our 1 Thessalonians series until the first of the new year. And that's because um, what comes next is this uh, really heavy uh, exhortation against sexual immorality. And so uh, I want us to not have to rush through that and I also need to make sure parents have advance notice before we get into that. Um, so we will do that in, in uh, January. But today we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, and just the opening phrase, which is, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Last Sunday, we saw four phrases that emphasize the importance of Christian growth. This week, we have the importance of Christian growth in one word, and that is the word sanctification. Let's back up, from, read from verse 1. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. You can see from the word for at the beginning of verse 3 that he's continuing the same emphasis on growth when he says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. So, uh, I realize that I've never actually preached in one sermon uh, just a, an explanation of the doctrine of sanctification. So, that's what we're going to do this morning. That's why you have a ginormous handout, uh, lots of Scripture. But I do not think you will find this to be dry or irrelevant. The, this is our every day, and these truths are really, really encouraging. So, I'm excited to work uh, through this together. Why don't we pause and pray before we start into that? Our Father, we praise You for church families that You bring diverse people together and make them brothers and sisters because we are all heirs with the Son. And so here, brought into your family, we love and serve and build up one another. And we praise you for that, the tremendous blessing of this family in our lives. Now we come as a family to the table because we need to get fed. And we have already been fed in many ways this morning, but now we gather for this kind of main course from your word. Would you help us to rightly understand it? And then would you, by the Spirit, let it not be trivia, not theory, uh, but very personal reality for us in relationship with you. So please guide us through these truths this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the word sanctification is a new word for us in 1 Thessalonians. It's not a word we've seen uh, up to this point. And if you just look in a concordance for the English word sanctification in the New Testament, it's a pretty rare word. In the ESV, it's only there six times. And yet, the root of this word is very, very familiar. We just don't see it quite as easily when we're looking at our, our English Bibles. So that's why I gave you that little list at the beginning. In 1 Thessalonians 3, in the section that we're in, there are actually six different words that are all from that same root. The word holiness in verse 13, the word saints in, in chapter 3, verse 13, and then in chapter 4, just in this section, we have the word sanctification, the word holiness two more times, and then the word holy in Holy Spirit. So see, if you look down the right, you see all those, that, that Greek root is the same for all those things, even though they're translated holy, holiness, saints, sanctification. Uh, so this is really a very, very big and familiar um, New Testament theme. So sanctification is part of the overall concept of holiness. And so number one, it's essential because God is holy. 1 Peter 1, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So what does that mean? 
What is God's holiness? First of all, God's holiness is his otherness. Sometimes we use the word transcendence. We could refer to his separateness. It doesn't mean that God is alone. It means that God is in a category all by himself. He's the only being who is God, and all the rest of us are creation. And what's the difference between those two categories? It's not like the difference between a second grader and a third grader, right? The difference between creation and God. So God's holiness is his transcendence, his being in his own category as God. He is not not like us, distinct from us because we are creation. But then, because God is in a separate category from us, he is also separate from sin. There is not the tiniest speck of impurity in him. So we can see both of these ideas of God's transcendence, his separateness as God, and then his separateness from sin. We can see both of them in a passage like Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, and here comes transcendence, high and lifted up. And then those, those angelic beings are, are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so then Isaiah says, woe is me, for I am lost or undone, for I am a man of what? Unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So there are two things that overwhelm Isaiah in that vision. One is how high and lifted up God is in transcendence, and the other is how pure and holy God is, because Isaiah is immediately very aware of his own clean, uncleanness. God keeps his promises because he's holy. God can be trusted because he's holy. God does everything right because he's holy. God is worthy of worship because he's holy. God sent Jesus because he's holy. God punishes sin because he's holy. And so we can say that God's holiness refers to how he is set apart both in his own category as God and then set apart from all sin and all defilement. And from that, it's not hard to see how it is then important for us to be holy. We, we can't be holy in the transcendent sense, right? We can't be God. We're creation. But as God saved people, we can be set apart too. God's will is our set-apartness. So number two, sanctification is being set apart. And right here in 1 Thessalonians 4, we have um, a very practical example of that. Because verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now again, we'll come back after the new year and look at this more specifically. But for now, just note that Paul was writing from Corinth, writing to Thessalonica, And these were cities that were famous for their immorality. And so, this was the background of these new Christians, a culture in which just about anything was acceptable sexually. But now they had been saved by Christ. Verse 7, God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. So here we have this example of sexual immorality, and it's a very helpful example because it's so clear and it's so relevant. We live in a society where almost anything is allowed sexually, but can God's people live like that? No. We have to live in a way that is set apart from that, rejecting the immorality of our world and living instead like God's set apart people. So immorality is the the practical illustration that we have here of what sanctification means. Another helpful illustration is the nation of Israel before Jesus came. Sanctification is illustrated by Israel under the Old Covenant. So this is an illustration of nations. Among all of the nations in the world, they were supposed to be a different kind of nation. 
No other nation like that nation. Exodus 19, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Deuteronomy 26, he will set you in praise and in fame and in honor high above all nations that he has made and that you shall be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. Leviticus 20, and you shall not walk in the customs of the nation that I am driving out before you. For they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. You shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. That's a tremendous statement of what sanctification means, what holiness is. In the context there in Leviticus 20, God's been describing all the kinds of immorality of the nations. And then he says, you can't be like those nations because I separated you from those people that you should be mine. So being set apart is not just being set apart from the ungodly ways. It's also being set apart to God. And that is exactly what happened when God saved us. He set us apart to be his. So sanctification is based upon your new identity. It is based upon your new identity. Romans chapter 6. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to, there's our word, right? Sanctification and its end, eternal life. Okay, so here's another illustration to help us. Sanctification is like fruit that grows from our salvation. When we are set free from the slavery of sin and instead set apart for God, there's a particular kind of fruit that grows in our lives, and it's the fruit of sanctification. So we have a new identity as people who belong to God, dedicated to God, consecrated to God, and sanctification is based on that reality, that we've been set apart for God. So that's our new identity, and the Bible illustrates that new identity in so many ways. Um, We can't begin to talk about all of them this morning. Um, I'll touch on just a few of them. But first of all, a little parenthesis, if sanctification is based upon our new identity, that means that sanctification is based, is, is a, the way it reads on your notes is, sanctification is a result of justification. Sanctification is a result of justification. So a quick review on what justification is. Justification is when God, the judge, declares that his law has nothing against a sinner so that the sinner is then right with God. That's only possible because Jesus lived a perfect life in our place and then died in our place for our sin. But then when we place our faith in Jesus alone, the holy judge can say, my law has nothing against you. You are right with God. That's justification. Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Sanctification is a result of, of justification. This is super important because there are many religions that in one way or another teach that sanctification is how you get yourself justified. If you live a set-apart life, then in the end, God will say to you, my law has nothing against you. You're right with God. You earned justification through sanctification, but that is not possible. Only Jesus lived a sinless life. Only Jesus could pay the penalty for our sin. Sanctification has to be a result of justification. 
And we'll see that then in each of these illustrations that you have listed here. Number one, sanctification then is learning to live as one who is truly... Well, look at the verse, Romans 6, 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and what? Alive to God in Christ Jesus. So learning to live as one who is truly alive. Before God saves us, we are dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2, 1. And dead things don't grow very well. But then God makes us alive, causing us to be born again. And now, because we're alive, we can grow. So consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Sanctification is like a new plant growing or a new baby growing. I recently saw that in the womb, the baby's brain is growing about 250,000 neurons a minute. That's what happens when you have new life you get growth. So sanctification is learning to live as one who is spiritually alive. Number two, it is learning to live as one who is set free from sin. It looks like a page turn, huh? Let's do it. We saw that just a moment ago in Romans 6.22 where it said we have been set free from sin. 1 Peter 2.16 Live as people who are free. Have you had one of those automatic bill payments that you didn't catch the fact that it was still paying even though you didn't owe anymore, but you were still paying them every month? We can do that with sin. Allowing it to be our master even though it's not our master any longer. Keeping payments even though we don't owe it anything any longer. Sanctification is learning to live as one who is set free from sin. And also in Romans 6, we see that sanctification is learning to live as the servant of a new master. You were once slaves of sin. You have become slaves of righteousness, slaves of God. So now present your members, he's referring to the parts of your body, present your members as slaves to righteousness. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 1. And remember 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There's sanctification, and it then means learning to live as the servant of a good and wonderful master, a new master. Next, sanctification is learning to live as a citizen of a new kingdom. When we took a team to Togo a couple years ago, a year and a half ago, I guess, one of the things we did in advance was try to learn a little bit about what you need to know in a different country. For example, in Togo, if a pedestrian gets hit by a vehicle, it is the pedestrian's fault every time, no matter what. And the reason for that is because it's, it's crazy roads and people all over and the, the temptation to just happen to get yourself hit by a car to get a big insurance payment would be significant. So if you get hit by a car, your problem. Good to know before you go to Togo. But, but Colossians 1 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. And the difference between the domain of darkness and the kingdom of God's Son is far greater than the difference between the United States and Togo. And you see why that means sanctification is important. When you get saved, you've had a change of kingdoms that is massive. Now, what is this new kingdom like? How do I live in this new kingdom? kingdom. It takes time to learn what matters in God's kingdom, and that process is sanctification. And then 
Finally, and again, this is just a sample list. This list could keep going and going, but for our samples, number five, sanctification is learning to live based upon the knowledge of God. And the reason why I included that one is because it's right here in 1 Thessalonians 4. If you go back to 1 Thessalonians 4 and look at verse 5, he says, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. <clears throat> so once you didn't know God, but now you do. So sanctification is learning to live in the light of who God is. And that's why the Bible puts a very strong emphasis. When it talks about sanctification, it puts a very strong emphasis on how we think. Like Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Sanctification doesn't just come from our willpower. It comes from a complete change in how we think about things and even a change in what we want and what we desire. We need an overhaul in how we see life and see the world, and see ourselves. And it's as God changes our, our minds and hearts that then it changes how we live. So we could keep going with many more examples and illustrations, but hopefully these are sufficient to show us that sanctification is based upon your new identity. It's learning to live as the new you, the new creation that you are in Christ. Now, we have to add to that, though, the truth that sanctification is also necessary because of your old identity. When God saves us, we become a new creation in Christ. That means there's new spiritual life in us. However, as we all know, there are old ways and old desires, and old habits that hang around. The Bible summarizes most of that in one of the ways that it uses the word flesh. Now, the New Testament uses the word flesh in a few different ways, but one of the ways it uses that word is to refer to the, what I call the remnant of our sinfulness that keeps hanging around. The part of you that sees sin and says, ooh, wouldn't that be nice? It's that part of your heart that's curious about what's the world doing? It's that part of you that likes to be selfish, that likes to always be right, that likes the approval of everybody else, that likes to be self-centered. It's the part of you that craves sinful pleasures. And the hard news is it's not going to leave you alone until heaven. Those old ways are going to stick around and you're going to have to wrestle against them. Though, the wrestling itself is evidence that you've been born again. Do not despair about the fight. The fight itself is encouraging, but it's a fight. Follow me through these texts on your handout. Romans 13, 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. So sanctification is necessary because of our old identity. And see how the two things go together? It's, because, it's necessary because of our old identity and it's based on our new identity. If we just looked at our old identity, oh, how we would despair. We would give up. But then we look at our new identity and we say, okay, if God has given me a new heart and if God has given me new spiritual life and if he's broken the power of sin over me 
And if he's given me his word and he's given me his spirit and he's with me, then in his strength, I'm going to fight against my old identity. I don't want to be that person any longer because now I'm set apart for God. I'm a God's child in God's kingdom and I want to live like it based on that new identity he's given me. Letter D, sanctification is the outworking of love. Of love. It's not a sterile checklist, but the outworking of love. John 14, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Whoever does not love me doesn't keep my words. And so what ultimately motivates sanctification is love, and most importantly, love for God. 1 John 5, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. When your pursuit of obeying them is driven by love for God, it's not a burden any longer. It's a joy. When we understand our old identity and our new identity, and we love God because he's the one who took us from our old identity to our new identity, then sanctification is not burdensome. It's, it's hard. It's like a battle, but it's a battle that we eagerly fight because we love God and love to please him. So sanctification is the outworking of love, but not just love for God, it's also the outworking of love for others. Our old identity is not loving. It's all about self, but our new identity has a new love for others because God implants his own love in us and it begins to grow in us. And we can see that in our text from last Sunday. So if you look back at the end of 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Do you see the connection between growing in love for one another and having your hearts established blameless in holiness? They go right, right together. Sanctification is growing in love. It is the outworking of love. And letter E, sanctification is toward Christ. Toward Christ. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, we saw in Galatians 4 this kind of heart-wrenching cry from Paul, my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Ephesians 4, till we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Grow up to be like Christ. Sanctification is not just do less bad stuff and do more good stuff. <laughs> Sanctification is a restoration into the image of Christ. It is like clay on a pottery wheel being shaped to look like Jesus. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more like Jesus. Sanctification, letter F, is by the Spirit through the Word I gave you there several places that directly refer to how sanctification is by the Spirit. If you would look back with me at 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. So the Spirit is the one who carries out God's sanctifying work in us using the tool of, of the Word of God. That's why Galatians 5 tells us to keep in step with the Spirit. Look also, um, John 17, 17, Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. So sanctification comes from the Spirit by the Word. And then letter G, sanctification is active. 
just to remind us that we are actively involved. Remember the four things we saw in last Sunday's sermon? Four phrases about growth, and of those four, one was our responsibility to be growing, one was other people's role in helping us grow, and two were God's sovereign hand in our growth. And so, sanctification is active. Chapter 4, verse 1, we ask and we urge you. And at the end of chapter 4, verse 1, do so more and more. Verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. You abstain. It doesn't mean that it's all up to us. Praise the Lord for God's power and God's work, but our active involvement is essential. Hebrews 12, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness. So, strive for holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So, sanctification is active, calling for our continual attention and effort. All right. We have two more points to make, but we have just flown through like the biblical doctrine of sanctification in 20 minutes. <laughs> so let's breathe for a second. And I just put in your notes three kind of like definitions or explanations just as review. These are from people who can word this better than I can. Uh, so let's just read those, the three that are on your, your notes there. Sanctification is the ongoing supernatural work of God to rescue justified sinners from the disease of sin and to conform them to the image of His Son, holy, Christ-like, and empowered to do good works. We may define sanctification as that gracious operation of the Holy Spirit involving our responsible participation by which He delivers us as justified sinners from the pollution of sin, renews our entire nature according to the image of God, and enables us to live lives that are pleasing to Him. And then I love these explanations from J.I. Packer. The concept is not of sin being totally eradicated, that is to claim too much, or merely counteracted, that is to say too little, but of a divinely wrought character change, freeing us from sinful habits and forming in us Christ-like affections, dispositions, and virtues. Regeneration is birth. Sanctification is growth. In regeneration, God implants desires that were not there before. Desire for God, for holiness, and for the hallowing and glorifying of God's name in this world. Desire to pray, worship, love, serve, honor, and please God. Desire to show love and bring benefit to others. In sanctification, the Holy Spirit works in you to will and to act according to God's purpose. What He does is prompt you to work out your salvation, i.e. to express it in action by fulfilling these new desires. Christians become increasingly Christ-like as the moral profile of Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, is progressively formed in them. That's very, very well said. All right, two more big ideas before we finish. Letter H, sanctification is not only a present growth, it is also a status based on the past and a fulfillment that is certain in the future. A status based on the past and a fulfillment that is certain in the future. So, we normally use the word sanctification to refer to this present process in our lives. That's great. However, it is important and encouraging to understand that the Bible also uses the word for a status or a standing that we already have and for something God's certainly going to do in the future. So, first of all, when you were saved, God already set you apart as His own. 1 Corinthians 6, such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. 
You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That's why the Bible consistently calls Christians saints. That means people who have been set apart for God. 1 Corinthians 1, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. This is true of every believer. They have been sanctified and they are saints because God has set us apart. You, that, you have been sanctified. That is your current standing. That is your current status. And I hope you can say, praise the Lord. God sets you apart to be his. And not only that, but you will someday be completely sanctified. Dr. McCune writes, the resolution of this conflict is not in doubt. That battle between your flesh and the spirit is real, and it is hard, but the end result is not in doubt. And so we come again, if you take your Bible and go to 1 Thessalonians 5, we come again to that beautiful promise at the end of 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 23. Now, may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. Isn't that a glorious set of four words? Himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. There is a final sanctification coming, and because God is faithful, He will surely do it. And again, we say, praise the Lord. So, as you saw in two of our songs this morning, the past, present, and future aspects of salvation are frequently referred to as justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification, sanctification, glorification. And we sometimes, to kind of simplify, we say that is, that is being delivered from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. Justification, the penalty of sin. Sanctification is this increasing del- deliverance from sin's power over you. Glorification is your final deliverance from sin's presence at all in your life. Okay, that's a great way to think that through. You also need to know, though, that the Bible uses the word sanctification for all three parts. You have been set apart by God already. Done. That's your standing. You are being set apart by God, increasingly growing to live in those ways we've talked about and you will be completely, perfectly set apart by God, freed from sin's presence completely someday. Finally, sanctification is relational. So back in 1 Thessalonians 4, what we've skipped over is the first words. For this is the will of God your sanctification. And that phrase, will of God, tells us how personal and how relational it is. Now, maybe the phrase will of God doesn't sound personal or relational to you, but what if we translate it, this is what God wants, your sanctification, which would be a perfectly legitimate way to translate it. Or, this is what God desires, Now it starts to sound a little more like a person who's desiring this, right? Which is what it is. It's God personally desiring these things, wanting these things. It's His will, His moral will for our lives. Look at verse 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. And then remember that back in verse 1, we had the phrase, to please God, and to do so more and more. Ephesians 5.10, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So, sanctification, it is not 
a mechanical process. It is not a checklist of duties. It is part of a personal relationship with God. And that's why I just love that picture in Galatians 5 of keeping in step with the Spirit. That picture of two people side by side who are harmonizing their steps so that they're literally walking in step with each other. You can't get much more relational than that picture of walking. And that's saying you keep in step with God. Isn't that crazy? With the Spirit of God in your life, synchronize your steps with His. That's how personal sanctification is. The world says, listen to yourself. And the Bible says, walk with God and talk to God. Listen to Him. The world says, follow your heart. And the Bible says, follow God's heart. Remember, sanctification is only possible because you've been set apart to God. So at its very core, sanctification is a relationship. It's a living, growing relationship with God that changes your life a little bit at a time. To be alive, to be like the living person you are, to live in freedom from sin because you have been set free from sin, to live in the knowledge of God because you do have the knowledge of God. To live in it like you're part of a new kingdom. To live like you're part of a new family. Ah, oh, it all flows out of what God has done for us in Christ. I hope that encourages you. Because I know we can get stuck in these points where, where it feels like obedience is burdensome and especially feels like we're just never going to break through. Like our flesh just keeps hanging around, causing the same problems, and there's just no joy in sanctification for us. And my prayer for you is that through what you've heard this morning, God might restore to you a little bit of the joy of sanctification. That you would be able to say, that's cool. I am excited about what God is doing in my life today. So I'm going to close now with this charge and... uh, benediction. So the charge I'm taking from 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 1, and then the, the, the blessing of the benediction comes from Acts 20, verse 32. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 1, I ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as we have been taught how we ought to walk and how we ought to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. And then Acts 20, verse 32, Now, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You're His. May the Lord bless you.